I saw that there was a debate between Senator Ron Johnson and uh, Joe Walsh. I was uh, I actually saw Joe Walsh. I was on a panel with Joe Walsh at LibertyCon about Ukraine. And Senator Ron Johnson, a MAGA senator, is going to debate Joe Walsh here on Ukraine on that rag uh, Zero Hedge. They hosted a debate on, uh, on Rumble, I think maybe on a few other platforms as well. And so I thought, you know what, even though I'm not a big fan of Zero Hedge, at the end of the day, a debate is a debate, and I do enjoy a good uh, intellectual joust, I guess. And Ron Johnson is a sitting senator. So if there's a sitting senator there, then I guess I have to treat it semi-seriously. So let's watch it. Let's check it out. Uh, it's quite a, a lengthy debate. I don't know how much of it we'll watch, but I am interested to see how uh, how far the capture has gone in the Republican Party. Let's check it out. Your line. Welcome to everyone from the Zero Hedge community and from Senator Johnson's Twitter and my Twitter page. And I think you've uh, kindly retweeted the show. So welcome everyone to this debate. It's an issue that I consider to be the most serious at the moment, yet not getting the attention it deserves. Ukraine is losing ground, struggling with ammunition and manpower, while the West debates how much more aid to send. Russia is preparing for a new offensive this year, while Ukraine is likely hunkering down behind defensive lines and trying not to lose ground. It seems that Russia can sustain the war for longer, and Western support for Ukraine is showing cracks, as well as capacity constraints, especially when it comes to artillery shells. There was uh, some Lithuanian intelligence report that said that at this tempo of uh, combat, that the war could probably last for around another two years, maybe like two years or more, I think. I think it was around two years. Now, if you look at the amount of tanks they have in storage, if you look at the amount of artillery guns they have in storage, that is something that's probably gonna run out much sooner than manpower. Uh, well, quality manpower is another issue. Uh, they have a lot of people but eventually they will run out of quality tanks. And we've already seen some tanks that were, you know, models from the Stalin era being put in the service, not as indirect artillery support, but near the front line. And so if we're seeing like T-55s near the front, that does suggest that the Russians have a problem. And of the tank fleet, we're seeing a lot more T-62s getting destroyed when we used to see a lot more T-72s getting destroyed. And so that suggests that that quality degradation of the equipment they're using is going to probably get worse as we see their store houses continue to empty out. And the fact that they probably just cannot, I mean, not probably, they cannot produce enough tanks, enough IFEs, enough uh, APCs to replace the ones that they're losing in Ukraine. And so they're just activating more and more old equipment. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to run out of it tomorrow or the next day. Again, it's going to take... A year, two years, depends on how the tempo of, of the combat uh, goes going forward. But the Russians are taking very high losses. So I don't want anybody to be under the assumption that Russia could just basically do this literally forever. Um, but obviously, two years, three, uh, two years is a, is a long ways away from right now, especially if you're on the front line in Ukraine. And they need the equipment to get to that point where they would be in a better negotiating position and where the Russians could have their units hit even harder so that they could speed that process up. And not only speed the process up, but include increase their leverage. Anyway, let's keep going. The war's death toll has been devastating to say the least. And Putin experienced his biggest challenge to his rule that many, many of you forgot, and that's a mutiny last year, even though it only lasted 24 hours. Ukraine is struggling with manpower, as I said, with the average age of Ukrainian troops at the front line now at 43 years old. I think the U.S. is about 25. In his annual State of the Nation address last week, Putin again warned of a nuclear war. Today, we're glad to have Senator Ron Johnson with us, as well as former Congressman Joe Walsh for this debate. And they will both help us understand the current state of the war and the path forward that we have or the multiple potential paths forward. Senator, uh, I would like to start with you. Again, pleasure to have you, sir. Glad to be here. As the only member of Congress, if I'm correct, to have attended Zelensky's inauguration in 2019, how has your perception of Zelensky 
as well as the Ukraine war today, changed since 2019, especially since the invasion two years ago? Well, first of all, I think let's get on the table what we all agree on, I would imagine. You know, we all think Vladimir Putin's an evil war criminal. Uh, we all have a great deal of sympathy for the Ukrainian people. Uh, they're fighting for their, their families, for their country, for their freedom. Uh, they were invaded. There, were, there was no for reason for Putin to invade. Um, I think it is interesting when I, when I... There was no reason for Putin to invade. What does he mean by that? Like, no good reason, I assume, is, is his point. Um, but if that's the case, let's, let's write that down. Let's keep that down. There was no good reason for Putin to invade. Not only attended his inauguration, but I went back... Because if he's invading for bad reasons and then performs bad, but then gets rewarded, then could he not invade other countries for those same bad reasons if we end up not standing with our allies? Just saying to Ukraine uh, a couple months later with Chris Murphy. I, I, I've been, I had been either the chairman or ranking member of the Center for Foreign Relations European Subcommittee, so I've made about seven trips to, to Ukraine. And what was interesting, particularly in the second meeting, might have been in the first as well. F first of all, I think Zelensky was absolutely dedicated to defeating corruption. You know, I, think, I think it was the real deal. Uh, he was a political neophyte. The long knives were out immediately, so a very, very challenging task. But I thought what was interesting, now this is in 2019, uh, Russia has already illegally annexed Crimea. They've already come into and in occupying eastern Ukraine. But even at that moment, Zelensky recognized he had no chance of dislodging Putin. He knew it wouldn't be popular, but he told me, he said he was dedicated to doing a peace deal with Putin. So he could move on, focus on corruption, focus on integrating further the West. So. I, I have to give him an enormous amount of credit for having the courage just to stay. Uh, remember the Biden administration, I, I think they were ready to have Ukraine capitulate right away. I mean, offering him a plane. By the way, I just want to say, because I assume this will come up later, that it is true that Zelensky was much more willing to make peace with the Russians. That's not why he got elected, though. He got elected on an anti-corruption platform. Um, that was part of his campaign, but more minor part of his campaign. He wasn't Petro Poroshenko. That was his main benefit. And he didn't come from the political establishment. Some people viewed him as a, uh, I don't know if this reminds anybody of anything, a Molotov cocktail, the political establishment of his country. Um, anyway... When he was in office, obviously the conditions between then and now have changed. The Russians have once again violated another ceasefire, lied about not wanting to invade again, and then performed much worse than anyone could have expected. And the Ukrainian military has also grown, has got more support, and is becoming more integrated in the West. And it now knows that a peaceful negotiated settlement to issue things like Crimea uh, the odds of something like that happening, as i.e., okay, let's have a referendum where we get all of the people who are displaced and all the people who are still there uh, together, that's at least not likely for the foreseeable future, even though he tried to pursue, pursue something along those lines. So I would say that the conditions have changed since uh, Senator Johnson was there. That doesn't mean he didn't, he wasn't genuinely trying to do that at the time. It's just since February of 2022, and since the failed Russian march on Kiev, a lot has changed. Right out of there. Had he taken that plane ride, I, I think Ukraine would have collapsed and Russia would be in total control. But he didn't do that, even though he knew crack uh, Russian assassination teams were after him. So he stayed there. So the courage of the Ukrainian people is just unquestioned. And that's why I think Americans have so much sympathy for them. But I started laying out what By I... By the way, Americans should have also sympathy for the Ukrainians because... We told them that we would make them an international pariah if they did not give up their nuclear arsenal and then assured them that if they did give up their nuclear arsenal, because we were concerned about those nuclear weapons being owned by a ton of new countries, we wanted them to give those nuclear weapons over to the Russians. We said that we would give them security guarantees and the Russians would as well if they gave it up and that they would be making a sacrifice for international nuclear security for our security. Then they gave them up. So I think that's probably another reason there should be sympathy. That's not even talking about them helping us with operation, military operations post-collapse of the Soviet Union, um, any commitments we've made since then. But I think that is a big reason why Americans should also be sympathetic towards the Ukrainians is because they gave up something that guarantees their security at our request for, our, for what we perceived as at least partially our security. 
I think is the reality over a year ago. The sad reality, it's an awful reality, I hate it. Vladimir Putin will not lose this war. L losing the war is existential to Vladimir Putin. He, you talked about the coup. Um, he has nuclear weapons. He threatens to use them. Um, but the fact of the matter is, Russia has four times the population. Uh, they have a much larger industrial base, a much larger military industrial base. They, they can produce four and a half million 155 millimeter shells at a cost of $600 a shell. Uh, the West, we're, we're struggling to produce a million a year. So there's a few things that I'm noticing here that it's kind of throwing me off. So first thing about that statistic, they can produce 4.5 million shells at the cost of $600 uh, per shell. He's not talking about what types of shell. He's not talking about the quality of the shell because the quality of Western shells is higher. But the Russians are producing 4 million shells a year. The Russians, according to at least Western intelligence estimates, are producing 1 1.2, 152 millimeter and 800,000, uh, I believe 122 millimeter. I forget the other millimeter, but I believe it was 122 millimeter shells a year. They're also getting shipments from the North Koreans, mind you. And they're also starting to supplement, I think, some of their artillery with drones, much as the Ukrainians are, even though the Ukrainians do it much more. But they are producing 4.7 million shells a year. And the Russians have much uh, have grown their uh, artillery production by increasing excess capacity at already existing plants, by expanding already existing plants. Now, they will continue to increase capacity at least somewhat more, but a lot of the increased capacity that they need to invest to invest in to go further than what they're doing now has, is going to have a, a lot of, well, I guess, investment time. You can't just produce a factory out of thin air. Some of these factories are going to take time to be made, get produced, get staffed. And right now there's a huge labor competition issue in Russia, huge labor shortage. He talks about the high population. Well, if you were working in the Russian uh, military or you're working a military equipment or you're working in the Russian military industry in recruiting of laborers, it doesn't feel like that with the type of salaries they have to put out in order to get people to work at those jobs. And they have increased over time. They have increased people's hours, done everything they can to try to get excess capacity out of these factories. But they cannot just endlessly keep doubling their artillery production. It's for a lot of these investments they're making, it's gonna take five or six years for the rewards on those investments to come out. Well, in the United States, our investments into artillery production, we're gonna start to see those rewards getting reaped very shortly. In fact, we're already seeing them getting reaped. Last year, I believe it was in uh, April of last year, we produced like 26,000 shells, um, uh, I believe it was a month. Uh, as of April of this year, we're gonna be producing, I think near 40,000 to 48,000 shells a month. By 2025, we'll be nearing 100,000 shells a month. That's 1.2 million shells a year. That's a lot of shells. There's a lot of 155 millimeter shells. And that's just the United States. That's not talking about the fact that the Europeans have opened up international markets to purchase shells where the French, the Sifrits, and the Greeks were opposing it before. Now that they missed the 1 million shell deadline, the Czechs have organized 800,000 shells, 500,000, 152 millimeter, uh, I believe, no, 155 millimeter, 300,000, uh, 122 millimeter. And European shell production is increasing. Domestic Ukrainian shell production is increasing. And that's not even talking about drawing on our Asian allies, as we've got 500,000 shells from the South Koreans. It's not a question of, can the Ukrainians get those shells? It's a question of, will we make the investments necessary to get those Ukrainians those shells so they can either A, try to push to win the war, or B, best if that doesn't work, then get the best deal, get the best negotiation possible. Because if we just cut off the Ukrainians and tell them to negotiate, the Russians are going to look at them and say, I'm not negotiating with you. I'm just going to barrel you over. I'm going to barrel you over because you don't got any backers. And if we look at the Ukrainians and say, well, we're not going to immediately abandon you, but we're going to really strain you of as much resource as possible to make you negotiate, the Russians are going to see it as, oh, they don't have a lot of hard power. We have more hard power. We have more power at the negotiating table. And then Ukrainians get a worse deal, the Russians get a better deal, and the bad behavior that led to this invasion in the first place is encouraged, and there's no reason to stop it. The revanchist claims were rewarded. So I think even if you wanted to get a negotiated settlement, you would still want to send them weapons. But the idea that shell production is an element where the Ukrainians just cannot compete 
over the next year if we make the right investments that's why 2024 is such a crucial year it's gonna have a real impact on the battlefield in fact we got like 4.6 million cluster shells still in reserves that body could send over at any point and i think he should send over hundreds of thousands of those shells uh if he, if he wants to continue with the policy of sending over cluster munitions i don't know why he stopped if he still has 4.6 million in the storehouse so he could send over 600,000, still keep a strong reserve as uh uh for i know for safety purposes for a rainy day fund as the Biden administration i don't know that's not how they put it but that's how they think about it there's there's ways for us to compete here so i'm painting this as inevitable is wrong now if he wanted to say i don't think it's worth it that's another question that's a more respectable answer in my opinion because if you say that then i can then you can at least acknowledge the fact that yeah i mean of course we can have impact on the war's conclusion but it's just not worth it. That's more liber maybe that's a more libertarian position. That's a position that maybe somebody's more pacifistic. Uh, but at, at least it's it's something that I, I can tangle with more because then it's an ideological disagreement, not like a factual disagreement. Um, as for the manpower thing, obviously manpower is an advantage Russia has, but they've had problems fulfilling their recruitment quotas. They're still not referring to filling their recruitment quotas. They're getting 85% of their recruitment quotas. That's better than what they were getting before. But they're still talking about another wave of mobilization. And the one time Vladimir Putin took a real hit to his popularity was during the first wave of mobilization. That was the first time when you look at all the domestic polling, uh, uh, all the domestic polling data in Russia. And I know that doing polling data in Russia is extremely difficult. It's the one time you see he takes a real hit. So there are political risks. He's talking about the political risks of losing. What about the political risks of continuing a war that is just furthering your nation's slide down uh, uh down the sword that they have fallen upon anyway continuing and it's cost us probably an average five to six thousand dollars per shell i mean that's kind of a discussion wow. for for another day in terms of our military industrial complex I didn't know that uh, price discrepancy was there yeah, as well ten, i know the production capacity was there 10 times also uh, again if we're talking about population again afghanistan population much smaller than the Soviet Union, Vietnam, population much smaller than the United States. Obviously, these are different wars, but also the casualty percentages for the Russians and the Ukrainians are very different. You look at the battle data from Avdivka, man, it made Murs kill himself for a reason, the Russian mill blogger. We have quotes from Zelensky's inner circle saying, yeah, send us all the weapons you can. We just don't have the men to fire them. You, you yeah. mentioned the yeah. average age of Ukrainian soldiers, 43 years. So again, I don't like the reality. So the 43 year thing, What's left out is the fact that Russian soldiers' average age is like 38, 39. It's like very close to that as well. And the reason that their ages are so high is because both Russia and Ukraine faced this demographic issue where after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they didn't have a lot of young people born. And so there's like a steep demographic decline and they want to preserve the people between the ages of 18 to 27. That's why the majority of Ukrainian military exemptions are actually but for people between the ages of 18 27 when it comes to schooling having children stuff like that that's stuff that can get you exemptions and once you're older and your children have aged out of the house and you're more in your 40s or your 30s that's when you're most likely to get recruited by the ukrainian military because they have so many exemptions for young people they are talking about in the mobilization legislation this is an issue the ukrainian government is trying to address the government the military asked for 509,000 soldiers that's why the illusion was still in there the ukrainian government and I think, if I remember correctly, was thinking maybe something more around 300,000 soldiers, but they're debating this. They're talking about mobilizing women between the ages of 18 to 6 to have medical experience so they can work as medics and work at stabilization points to try to save lives. They're talking about lowering the exemption standards from just from 18 to 27 to 18 to 25. To try to get the 26 to 27 age group recruited into the armed forces they're talking about a whole bunch of things but this is an issue that the ukrainian armed forces is trying to deal with and it is something that presumably the russians are trying to deal with as well but it's just another wave of mobilization would be very politically difficult for the russians just as it is for the ukrainians and so they've been doing it in a lot more let's say covert way they call it like covert mobilization closing up certain loopholes or changing little policies about recruitment here and there to get another fifty thousand soldiers there another fifty thousand there but they can't like they, they can't just do that forever and ever i mean i mean they could presumably attempt to but i don't know how effective that'll be the only way this war ends is in a negotiated settlement i'm not gonna okay even if you agree with that then the position would be we give the ukrainians as much as possible so they can get the best negotiated deal and so we can dissuade a future russian invasion even if you believe 
this and i can understand even now you need to negotiate russian withdrawal he's not wrong that at some point there will be some form of negotiation even if it's just negotiating the exchange of russian pow's and their withdrawal out of the country in the best case scenario um but again all of the if you wanted to get the best case scenario and under a negotiated deal the ukrainians are still ne going to need to be empowered i don't like the settlement Ukrainians aren't going to like it, uh, but every day that goes by, the settlement gets worse and worse and worse because more Ukrainians die, more Russian conscripts die. I take no joy in that. But this is the thing. If the settlement is made now, number one, do you think the Russians have offered a settlement? See, will they take that as, oh, okay, this is a good deal. We're going to accept it. It's, you know, whatever that deal is, no matter how good or bad it is, or will they take it as, well, the West isn't sending them bullets anymore. They're lowering down on that from the West. The Americans are now making them negotiate. It seems like the West doesn't want to support them anymore. Why even negotiate? We want to take more. In fact, if you look at Vdivka, the Russians lost, like, at best, like 17,000 soldiers to take a city of 30,000 people. That's And that's talking about deaths, not even casualties. If we talk about casualties, that could be potentially the size of the city, if not more, according to the Ukrainians. They added 42,000 casualties for the Russians. They wouldn't be making these big attacks and taking all these gigantic losses until they, unless they wanted to take more land. And so it was Ron Johnson not only talking about making the Ukrainians settle for what is currently occupied, but give them back here, Son, let them cross the Dnieper River, let them take Kramatorsk, Slovansk, leave Donetsk. Does that mean they're going to have to get vans and buses to take all the people out of their homes and help transport them away as the Russians came in and annexed all the land? I just, I just want to know how this negotiated deal, number one, how, how he knows that the Russians want to negotiate and would take this negotiated deal that would be acceptable for both Ukraine and the United States. Because if it's not acceptable for Ukraine, to some extent, we need to acknowledge that the locals have a better idea about how the country is gonna survive or what the country needs to survive than a lot of people who don't live there. Even if we accept this deal, how do we know that the Russians won't just attack again? Especially if the deal means no security agree agreement or arrangement for the Ukrainians and the 85,000 sized military that the Russians asked for during the start of the invasion. Do we really think that after invading, if you were the Ukrainians, would you agree to a deal that says, okay, fine, no army, we'll get rid of our army. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that's being assumed here. It assumes that the Russians want to negotiate. It assumes that if the Russians did negotiate with you, that the Russians would give you a deal that would be acceptable. And, but of course, that depends, depends upon what he thinks, uh, what type of deal is acceptable. And it also assumes that the Ukrainians would accept the deal. And I would also need to ask, if the Ukrainians didn't, would you be willing to abandon them, despite the national security implications that that would mean for the United States, Europe, NATO, and the credibility of the United States? These are people yanked out of their villages, sent to the front lines to be cannon fodder in this bloody stalemate. And more Ukraine gets destroyed. So I think U.S. policy should be directed toward bringing... Yeah, would, you, would he call, like, the D-Day Normandy landings, would he call those soldiers, like, cannon fodder? I just, I just want to... Like, would he talk about, like, ah, uh, yes, Sergeant uh, Johnson, who, who landed on the beaches of Normandy, that cannon fodder took out that German position, or, oh yeah, we had some cannon fodder during the Battle of Fallujah that got mowed down. I just, how, it's, I don't know, I just don't like that description. I understand where he's trying to go from with it. I just, I don't, I, I, it's, it's the politicization of the language that I think is obvious. Bringing Putin to the negotiating table, not fueling mindlessly a bloody stalemate. When, when I hear people like Senator Schumer come out of the White House meeting and say, this is simple. If Ukraine gets the $60 million, they win. If they don't, they lose. It's not that simple. That is true. But it's also not as simple as Johnson. Johnson's just the other end of the spectrum. How are they going to win? It's kind, of, it's kind of like horseshoe theory, honestly, a little bit here. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been to secure briefings. There's no strategy that I've heard of how you actually defeat Vladimir Putin. Mm. Well, there is a strategy. I just don't think he's been either paying attention or listening to Zelensky. The strategy centers on Crimea. And this is the Ukrainian strategy. It is long range missiles targeting their logistics, undermining their ability to transport goods, destroying missile defense, radar systems, 
down south to make it so the Russians can't transport their goods to the front so then the Ukrainians can start the push. Because then once the Russians are logistically damaged and they can't transport their goods and that Crimea is isolated, uh, it'll be much more difficult for them to transport uh, bombs, artillery shells, tanks, etc. and defend the south. Um, of course, this strategy would need to account for the fact that the Russians are now trying to take advantage of new railways along the land bridge, uh, which the Ukrainians are trying to damage and undermine the work there. But there is a strategy that's part of the reason why we're seeing so much attacks on the Black Sea fleet. People think it's, oh, it's completely worthless, it's nothing. You'll see from like some pro-Russia Western uh, English speakers. You don't see from the pro-Russia Telegram accounts. They acknowledge that losing these ships is very bad. Like $65 million ship here, $100 million ship there. They're not coping for it. Some cope for it saying, well, the Ukrainians won't have a Navy, so this isn't important. If you take out the Navy that can support Crimea, especially if we're talking about transport ships, then yeah, that is logistically significant, especially since those transport ships were transporting artillery shells and other equipment while it was being blown up, while they were blown up by the Ukrainian uh, naval drones, the Sea Baby drones. So there is a strategy. Uh, it's just that I I don't know if he I, I guess maybe Biden hasn't said that in a closed door meeting, but there is a strategy. Maybe he doesn't pay as much attention as I do. I don't know. Russian people support this war. Uh, the the only only way you grind them down is if you start offensive operations into Russia and you start making the the Russian people. We're not going to do that. We can't risk nuclear war, which is one. By the way, that's not true that the only way you can grind down the Russians is by doing offensive operations into Russia. If that's the case, then how did the Vietnamese grind us down? How did the Afghans grind us down? How did the Afghans grind the Soviets down? How did any type of army that another people invaded and then got grinded down and then left? How did that happen anywhere? One of the reasons the Biden administration in the West hasn't really provided the kind of weaponry Ukraine would need to push back more effectively. Yeah. So again, we're, we're in this bloody stalemate. That's not going to change. This war needs to end. I, again, I don't like that reality, but that's basically been my... But this, this is the question. If you want the war to end, just like everybody else wants the war to end, but the demands from the Russians are preposterous. Like they're saying, well, you got to give us back the city of Kherson, which the Ukrainians liberated. You know, the Ukrainians have liberated over 50% of the territory that the Russians have captured since the start of the 2022 invasion. You'd be asking them to give back 25% of that. Based upon what? The Russians aren't close to doing any naval landing across the city, but the Russians did announce that it was annexed. What if that's what they demand? They, the, the, this is the thing about negotiation and wanting peace. It's like, yes, of course everybody wants peace, but if you go in there and the, and the cost of peace is, is, is shackles, then yeah, I, I think a lot of people are not going to be too happy. My position. Uh, Senator, I've got a lot of questions, like if, and, like, and I'm going to start off with... Like if, for example, when we withdrew from Afghanistan, what if a condition of withdrawing from Afghanistan was like, okay, fine, we got to give the Taliban Florida. It's just like, if once you make, like, of course you wanted peace. Of course you wanted to bring the troops home. Of course. But if that's the new terms and conditions for peace, then peace some t somehow, through the loss of territory, the loss of those people, through the loss of something, has now become more painful than the war at least for the people negotiating, at least for the Ukrainians, and probably the most, uh, most evidently. With how did we get here? But before that, Congressman, just your initial thoughts on what the senators mentioned, what he calls the reality that we're facing now that you've been talking about for over a year now. Would love your general thoughts on this before we get into the questions. By the way, my general thought on whether the Ukrainians can win or not, I am not some, uh, I'm not a doomer and I'm not a bloomer, okay? My opinion is the dice of history is rolling right now and depending on our actions this year and the year after, it's gonna be, it's gonna heavily determine the outcome of the war. Do we get them enough shells? Do they produce enough drones? Do they deal with command issues fastly enough? How, do the Russians uh, expand their drone production well enough? Do the Russians, are they able to get more shells from the North Koreans? Are the Russians able to improve its mass infantry assault tactics? Are they able to improve their command structure to make it so that when they're doing combined arms warfare, they're more coordinated? Are they able to improve the precision of their glide bombs? There's so many different factors involved here, especially after the Wagner coup, that I'm highly skeptical of anybody telling you the war's over. Here's the one indicator I found that proves the war's over. I'm very skeptical of those people.
it's, it's interesting because there's like there's positive for the ukrainians and the black sea fleet there's negatives for the ukrainians when it comes to the loss of some territory around areas like Avdivka right now but there's also negatives for the russians when it comes to the massive casualties they're taking in order to push those losses the uh the pretty qu uh, i mean i would say the rapid pace of the assault after assault after assault in order to try to take that land the high expense of ammunition i mean yeah, there's there's negatives and positives. There's so many different factors that when I hear somebody say artillery production is why they can't win, I roll my eyes, especially when you know what we know about international artillery markets and the fact that there are people who could increase artillery production. There are artillery on international arms markets that could be bought up. And we have South, uh, I mean, uh, East Asian allies that could also be assisting us. Seen. Senator Johnson and I agree a lot on what the reality is right now. Um, we may have a disagreement on what to do moving forward. And it's, it's great to be here. And again, as, as I, Ron, as I came into this, and um, Mario, it's great to be with you. I, I didn't think of this as a debate. Like I thought of this, if President Biden put you and I in a room and said, figure this damn thing out. Uh, uh, the, the, the reality, Ron, that you've just expressed, figure out what we need to do. I agree with Senator Johnson. I think Joe Walsh is going to be a little pillow fisted here, man. I hope he, I hope he gets assertive. Uh, Russia won't lose if it's just Ukraine. If they're fighting Ukraine, they're too big. Putin doesn't give a fuck about life. He'll just keep throwing bodies out there. Damn. That is the reality. Um, Russia, we can talk about what victory means, and I think there are a few different scenarios. Russia could ultimately lose if it's Ukraine and the West. And the West has to make that. He's right. He's right, you know. I mean, lose a traditional war. People talk about like a long 20, 25 year Ukrainian guerrilla war. I don't want to get into those scenarios and start like LARPing and fucking LARPing as a. As a, as, a, as a guerrilla fighter in the woods. But yes, what he's saying here, I think is true. That decision, how committed will they stay and to what end? When you say Russia could lose, and this is gonna be a question for later, but I will touch on it briefly now. How do you define winning or losing in this war? By the way, it's a great Joe Walsh should bring up artillery production rates in the West. He should talk about increased artillery production rates in the United States. The fact we're gonna have 100,000 uh, shells being produced a month next year by this time next year the fact that we have artillery production in europe increasing that we have the europeans for the first time opening up to the international arms market i i don't know how much joe walsh knows about this stuff but i hope he doesn't just let you know ron johnson just lay out like statistic here 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 and then joe walsh just like responds generally in a way that is you know i guess sympathetic but doesn't add any supporting evidence Great question. And I, I, I think from our, I think from Ukraine's perspective, uh, and most people, Ron, I, I think would say this isn't realistic. Ukraine grabs back all of its territory, including Crimea and eastern Ukraine. Um, it, that's publicly what Ukraine will say. Get Russia out of my country. Again, and, and, and Senator Johnson nailed it. We, we, we gloss over you didn't, but we gloss over the context. Putin's a fucking thug who invaded a sovereign country. Uh, that sovereign country wants to fight for its sovereignty. Uh, let's not dismiss that either. It's, is it our place to say, Ukraine, you can't keep defending your, your sovereignty? I, so that, that would be Ukraine's ideal victory. Mm -hmm. I think there's a secondary victory from Ukraine's perspective that the Russian government changes and Putin's out of the picture. Um, I think from the West's perspective, and I'd be curious what Senator Johnson would say, I think our perspective, what does victory mean? We have no interest in overthrowing Putin's government. Well, like, if there was, like, a democratic revolution, of course, we'd be happy. But the United States is, I think, terrified of the instability. Uh, it's part of the reason I think that during the Wagner coup, the United States basically told Ukraine to chill the fuck out during it and not try to take advantage of it. It means that... As much as possible, Russia is pushed back. As much as possible, Russia is... We want to contain Russia. That's our goal. It's weakened to the point where they can't do this again, and we avoid any nuclear or major NATO or Russian confrontation. 
Mm. That, I think, would be victory from our perspective. And Senator, before I go to you on, on the same question, just want to remind the audience, when there's reality and there's what we would like to see. So for anyone, you know, we'd all love, I assume, for Russia to be outside of Ukraine, completely out of Ukrainian territory. But when you have an assessment came out by the New York Times last week, in October 2022, the US intelligence assessment said that they put the odds at 50-50 that Russia could launch a nuclear strike to halt Ukrainian forces if they breached its defense of Crimea. So I 50-50? I mean, how do you even... I mean, if they breach the defenses of Crimea, them using a nuclear weapon, I mean, what... God, I would, I would have to... What does that mean? I mean, this is the thing that, that gets me, is we don't have the information to know. We don't. But this sounds like people afraid of victory to me. That's what I'm hearing, that, okay, well, let's say you're right, Joe, but what if Ukraine winning is scary? Is because they could use a nuke. That that's at least the point, if I understand it. Now imagine this from the Ukrainian perspective. Imagine you're being told that you cannot go back and fight to win back your land that was just yours like ten years ago. That many people that I know of were displaced from. So you're telling people displaced from this land, you cannot fight to take it back, even if you've got a good chance of winning. Because if you take it back, it could lead to escalation that could end the world. And the people who are telling you that are the same people who made you give up the nuclear weapons to the nation who are now pointing them at you. With many of the missiles that they gave up to the Russians having already been refitted with other warheads and fired at Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's so... Uh, it would cause your blood to curl from that perspective. I mean, boil, curl. Blood doesn't curl. Do some gross blood. It cause, cause your blood to boil, I would imagine. Extremely frustrating. Now, wouldn't it make more sense if that is the case, if the Ukrainians were to break through and try to take Crimea, there could be the threat of their using a nuclear weapon against Ukrainian forces. Assuming that that is the, the intelligence assessment, would we really know until that scenario has come back? Until that scenario is like, how do we know this far out until Ukrainian forces are near Crimea and we see the circumstances at which the Ukrainians would attack, how Putin's reacting, how the international community reacts, how Xi reacts, because that's going to be a big issue. Xi Jinping has been very clear to the Russians that they are not happy with the idea of them using a nuclear weapon against Crimea. And the Chinese and the Indians, who would not be very happy about this idea, are both where they ran to to sell their natural gas products after the West stopped buying it. And so depending on how the international community pressures the Russians in these circumstances where the Ukrainians have gone up to Crimea and we don't know if they're going to attack, yeah, the circumstances will change. We're, we're, we're estimating 50-50 coin flip in a vacuum in October. So I just... I'm not saying that there's no risk. I'm just saying we haven't even reached this point yet. We can discuss the rich risk, I think, when we get to the bridge. I think that'd be the idea, you know, cross that bridge when you get to it. But also, we don't know the international situation, geopolitical situation, at which Putin would make that decision or try to make that call. I've got very close. Also, how many nukes would he have to launch in order to have an impact and actually stop the Ukrainian armed forces outside of, you know, send a signal? And would it be... Would the purpose be to stop the Ukrainian armed forces or would it be, be the purpose to use them in a way in order to cause like an international incident to raise the stakes and try to make, you know, the West reel back panic and find a settlement that pleases both sides or would please no one, but pro particularly would please the Russians to make them stop. Probably both. Most people in Ukraine have helped evacuate. Yet I know what the reality is. I was in Ukraine weeks before the war as well. And that applies to anybody that talks about the war. There's reality, and there's what we'd like to see. Senator, same question uh, before we dig into what got us uh, to where we are today. Uh, how would you define a Ukrainian win or a Russian loss? Again, I just want to end the war. Uh, another reality is, is... Oh, this is... See, this is silly. This is... See, this is getting to, like, like, like weird... Just, like, pacifistic for pacifistic sake... 
Like if, if he was just to say, I don't like the cost and that was it. Like my only intention is cost. That's all I care about. He's upfront with that. And they'd be like, okay, okay. I understand his perspective. I understand his point. But if his thing is just like peace, man, like he's a hippie or it's just like, all I want is to end the war. Like, okay, everybody wants the war to be over. But if the conditions don't exist for peace or we've set the foundation and it's shaky and then peace collapses later, like if we sign a peace deal that collapses within a year and then the Russians invade again, did we achieve anything there? And so without the conditions for peace and without the foundation for peace, therefore there has to be some justice in this peace, some shiny, some justice somewhere then you could end up either spoiling the peace before it's even begun or just setting the foundation for the next war. There are over 200 rounds of negotiation. 20, 20 negotiated ceasefires all failed. 21 would not be particularly an accomplishment, Senator. So just wanting, like, you gotta, you gotta have the foundations for it and you gotta wanna build the foundations for lasting peace, not just... Not to mention, like, there are things that are worth fighting for. That's not even talking... Like, I would say that the Ukrainian system that you're aiming for is better, but that's a totally separate conversation. Well, actually, no, it isn't, but I don't want to go on for too long. Is, yes, Ukraine claims that territory now, but as, Vlad, as uh, Vladimir Putin, in his interview with Tucker, gave the long history of, of really what Ukraine was, it's the borderland. You know, there are certainly Russian-speaking uh, people in Crimea and eastern Ukraine that would prefer being governed by Russia. I mean, that's, that's also reality. So it's one of the reasons they were fighting. Uh, it's one of, obviously, Vladimir Putin's concerns as well. Okay, well, here's a question. Texas used to be part of Mexico. If we found out that like 20% of the population in Texas, you know, the ones that spoke Spanish, so a, a percent, not even the majority of the ones that spoke Spanish, but just a percentage of the ones that spoke Spanish, wanted to be part of Mexico, like, would that be okay? I guess you can have... Texas is going back to Mexico. They had it at one point. And even, and even the dynamics there don't even match up because this is an instance of us taking Texas away. But the majority of the people in Eastern Ukraine did not want to be part of Russia. Just because you speak Russian doesn't necessarily mean you want to be part of Russia either. That doesn't mean there was nobody who wants that. But if that's the instant, if that's the case, if we're just doing this by language, then, well, I guess the Irish love the British and they want to return to the crown immediately because they all still speak the Queen's mother tongue. So... I, I do think it's important to understand what the other side's perspective is. Um, it, it's interesting if you go back in history and you, you listen to the conversation between and read the conversation between James Baker and Gorbachev. Uh, Baker was very concerned. This is is they're talking about reunifying Germany uh, after you know, the fall of the Soviet Union. And this is the 1990 time frame. Very concerned about Russian perception of should we keep U.S. troops in there? You know, should we do it on our own or as part of NATO? Uh, very concerned about you know pushing and not necessarily giving an ironclad guarantee so there's nothing in writing, but uh, sensitive that we're not going to move NATO to the east. Yep. Uh, we've done that a lot, um, and so you have to understand the other person's perspective in all this. Well, also the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, so. I think the circumstances have changed slightly. And so, so to me, victory is just a cessation of the hostilities. Uh, that is the, what? Victory in a war is just ending the war. Oh, then the Union could have won the Civil War very easily. They could have just said, stop. Okay, I guess we won, everyone. And who would have thought with Pearl Harbor? Well, how do we win, guys? Well, I don't know. Let's just tell the Japanese this sucks. Like, I... Come on. Like, if you want to say, like, like, look, victory isn't worth it, peace now, then that's one thing. But don't try to reframe that just peace in and of itself is a victory. Like, come on. just A negotiated settlement. I would love to have been a fly in the wall in Istanbul uh, a couple of weeks after the war started when they were already signing different, you know, various aspects of a peace agreement. And Boris Johnson... You know, airdrops into that thing, and all of a sudden that green agreement is, is blowing up. You know, you had the Minsk agreements. Again, I, I, I'm not privy to those things, exactly what happened. Now, Joe Walsh, I was, he was with me when I responded to this. Uh, did I respond to this claim? No, I responded to a different claim about Gorbachev. And the, ah, so, he, so he, I don't know if he knows this. 
But, you yeah, know, the Boris Johnson thing is bullshit. Uh, read Our Enemies Will Vanish. I think it does a good job at breaking down how it's bullshit. Um, there was a lot of things that led to those talks breaking down. One thing was definitely the massacres that were getting uncovered once the mass grave was uncovered in Bucha. That was something that made the Ukrainians, you know, not really feel like they were in a negotiating mood. And for anybody who thinks that's, you know, that's hard to believe that I would ask you, did Americans feel like it was a negotiating move after 9-11? Now, 9, 3,000 people died in 9-11. A lot more people have died in this war. So, I mean, you know, you can... You know, they weren't in a negotiating mood. The Russians had found had found out to they had found out were not as strategic genius or didn't have the idea of strategic genius in their mind of this image they had of them, which just wasn't there. They were flailing about, they were failing, to put it lightly, at the start of the invasion. So the Russians aren't doing as good. The Ukrainians are starting to push them back in some areas. The Russians are committing war crimes all across the board, and the West has just gotten in the United States corner. And this is the area where we did have an impact in Ukraine's corner, and we said, we got your back. All these things coalesced to make them not want to sign the deal. Also, the deal, we have details about the deal now. Part of the deal was for Ukraine to limit its armed forces to 85,000 people. Now, if you're Ukraine, and you just went through 200 failed rounds of negotiation, 20 failed negotiated ceasefires, and now another negotiated, failed negotiated ceasefires, and the Russians who said they would not invade have now invaded again, and then demanded you abolish your army, telling you that if you got rid of your army while well, they lied the last time and the time before that, they wouldn't invade this time when you were much weaker and easier to invade. The Ukrainians wanted an army of 250,000, so they were willing to shrink their army somewhat, but they weren't willing to shrink it down to 85,000. It wasn't just soldiers that were limited, by the way. It was tanks. It was artillery guns. It was all sorts of things. They were trying to turn Ukraine um, into a neutered military power. One that would be isolated diplomatically from the West, and therefore with no diplomatic leverage and no military, the Russians can assert its dominance at any point. So it's not surprising that the deal fell apart, at least in my opinion. Happened, but And so then when the West came up to Ukraine and said, we got your corner, we're going to uphold our end of the Budapest Memorandum. Well, the rest is history. But yeah, Boris Johnson didn't sink it. At least the idea that Boris Johnson went in there, like as he paints it and sunk it on his own, is fantasy. It would have been nice if we could have ended that war then. But by the way, I would also add. Again, it's just his lack of knowledge of the situation. I think we could have. I think we could have prevented Putin from from invading. I think mm -hmm. there are a couple of things we could have said. We're we're never gonna we're gonna respect the fact that uh, you're concerned about NATO on your border. We're, we're not gonna offer. This assumes that NATO membership. By, by, by conceding something like that, that that would stop the Russians from invading. And not only does it assume that that was the primary motivator or that there wasn't other things that would still compel him to invade, it also assumes that once we gave that concession, the Russians would then accept it and then that would be the line. But if we don't, if that's not the line and they keep going, not only are the Russians continuing to dominate conquer and attack ukraine and we got our pockets snatched like fools but ukraine will be diplomatically and militarily and geopolitically isolated unable to turn to us for support or able to try to integrate themselves into western defense structures if the worst is to come there was nothing that was going to allow ukraine into nato when 2022 came around anyway the turks the hungarians the germans the french they were all against it they were all opposed to it dramatically Viktor orban is still against it even after the invasion so we couldn't guarantee that they would never join nato but they weren't joining nato anytime soon in fact there was things entered into nato rules around not admitting countries who have territorial disputes because of ukraine's existence the west greatly appreciated the potential point of escalation that us just dragging Ukraine into NATO could be, how it could drag us into a war, which is why we avoided it. But the Russians were not satisfied with the status quo. They wanted more. The largest country on Earth wanted to be a little bit larger.
for NATO uh, membership. You know, we, we could have put uh, UN troops as a, as a tripwire. Uh, I don't think he would ever have considered invading Ukraine if Trump were. So wait, wait, let me hear that again. I'm sorry. What, what did you just say? From, from invading. I think mm -hmm. there are a couple of things we, we could have said we're, we're never going to we're going to respect the fact that uh, you're concerned about NATO on your border. We're, we're not going to offer NATO uh, membership. You know, we, we could have put uh, UN troops as a, as a tripwire. UN troops was the solution. How many UN troops? Would it, so like, when you say you wait, wait, I'm sorry. Back the fuck up. What did he just say? UN troops as a tripwire? Wait, in what way? Okay, a UN trip, a tripwire for what? A trip. UN troops are not supposed to act as a tripwire. If they were acting as a tripwire, that would insinuate that once the the Russians invaded, a giant UN army would be manifested and then sent to fight the Russians. Because a tripwire activates something, you know, a tripwire activates a booby trap. So the tripwires we have in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, they are not meant to stop Russian invasion through like sheer force of will. It's meant to signal that if the Russians attack these, that will activate Article 5, that will activate the United States, and now a giant army will start to manifest and counter you. It's it's like a, you, it's a you know a, 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 a signal of things to come. So if the UN force would be a tripwire, that would mean somebody would come to the defense of Ukraine if the Russians were to invade. Who would be that army? You can't just make it the UN. The UN doesn't have an army. There's UN peacekeepers, but I don't think Pakistan and Bangladesh are going to be able to wrangle around tw enough soldiers to stop the Russians. So there would have to be somebody who backs up that tripwire. Who would that be, Senator? Would it be the United States? Would it be the EU? Would it be NATO? At what point is this not functionally different than NATO membership? Would it just be because uh, there would be a lack of missile deployments? <sighs> anyway, continuing. Uh, I don't think he. So again, like I need to hear more about this tripwire. Like if the if if the argument was we need like fifty thousand to one hundred thousand UN troops across the border or some large force of troops and they're just going to stand there so the Russians will have to fire on the UN and then that would trigger international intervention then it's like okay well then yeah then they act as a tripwire and the, if there was those many troops it could also act as a you know a, something to stop the Russians from invading a disincentive but then that would also mean we would have to intervene. And then, like, for Americans, how is that functionally different than NATO membership? Like, would it just be because it wouldn't be our troops, it would be the UN? Why would the UN, assi would the UN sign up for this arrangement? I mean, maybe we could get them to sign up for this arrangement. Would ever have considered invading Ukraine if Trump were president, mm. and had there not been the embarrassing and dangerous surrender in Afghanistan that showed how weak America was. So again, there's... I think the, uh, number one, the Afghanistan troop withdrawal timeline does not work. The negotiations and the time where people assume from the actions Putin started to take when Putin roughly made the decision that, okay, fine, we're probably going to go in, was before the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I think people just like know this happened roughly around the same time, and so they just put them together. But I, I think I have not had the case made to me enough that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a direct, like, did, had this effect. I'm not saying it's impossible, I just haven't had the case made to me well enough. What was the other thing he said? About NATO on your border, we're, we're not gonna offer NATO uh, membership. You know, we, we could have put uh, UN troops as a, as a tripwire. That's so uh, I don't think he would ever have considered invading Ukraine if Trump were president. Oh, if Trump were president. Yeah, I just, no one has convinced me that of that either. Uh, it was the idea that Trump would nuke them or they would be scared of Trump nuking them. Um, and how do you make a threat like that credible uh, without there, you know, actually being a threat of Trump just nuking them because he's actually kind of crazy? Like, like, even in the scenario where, like, yeah, Trump's like the madman. That doesn't make me feel comfortable. That doesn't make me feel safe. But I still haven't had that case made to me particularly well either. And had there not been the embarrassing and dangerous surrender in Afghanistan that showed how weak America was. So again, there's there's a whole, you know, multiple steps in history that led to this. But now we've got this mess and this mess just has to come to an I, end. I would I, and I'd quibble with my good friend on Trump. I, 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 I think Trump would do whatever Putin told him to do. Um, 
But, and I think, though, forget about that for a minute, Ron. I think you and I would agree, maybe not, so I'll pose it as a question. I mean, Putin's objective here is to reassemble the Soviet Union. Uh, Putin considers Ukraine Russia. He's made that. When people say that. I assume what they mean is like he wants not to reassemble Soviet Union, but he wants to reassert a Russian empire, something of that ilk, not based around communist ideals, but around nationalist revanchism. That clear. He made that clear before he invaded. Uh, his security council came out a week ago and said, there's no sovereign Ukraine. That's Russia. Uh, so that, that's his victory. So what's Putin's victory? He takes Ukraine and then he continues to take what he wants to cobble together the old Soviet Union. The interesting question, Ron, is do we have an interest or what is our interest in trying to stop that? By the way, when I say, when I say it's Soviet Union, that assumes that it goes all the way up to all the old Soviet countries. I don't know if it would go, if the goal would be to go all the way up to East Germany. I doubt it. Um, they, they, I doubt they would have any interest in splitting up Germany again. So what exact countries it would be, it's hard to say, but Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania are certainly three that are of much, of, of much concern. Moldova is, I think, the one that is mentioned less, but should be of the most concern because there's already troops illegally deployed within Moldova in the breakaway region of Transistra, where Russia already intervened in the 1990s for, in its words, to defend the Russian speakers. So, I mean, if that rings a bell. Not to mention, Transnistria is openly, diplomatically signaling that it wants the Russians to come in. So let me just say, I don't buy the argument that you've got a domino effect. I mean, that's, that's what we use as justification for Vietnam. We never should have gone to war with Vietnam. JFK was right. We should have pulled those troops out, and you would not have had the domino effect and communism taking over the world. It wouldn't have happened. We should learn from that history. Um, I think Putin has got to recognize that he, he thought he could just roll into Ukraine and take it over. I mean, he has been bloody. This has not been a success for him. Let's be clear, though. When we say that, like, the domino effect, the reason the do I think part of the reason the domino effect didn't, it wasn't a thing, is because the reasons why the Vietnamese people were fighting had a lot less to do with communism than I think people really appreciated and a lot more to do with local nationalism. I mean, like Ho Chi Minh was much more of a nationalist than he was a communist. Uh, I mean, the reasons why domino theory did not pan out does not necessarily translate into the idea that revanchist dictators when appeased, therefore will not continue to go. I'm not saying that Russia takes some of Ukraine, therefore they move on and necessarily invade other countries. That's guaranteed. But if you do real damage to America's credibility or you make uncertainty about America's intentions in the region, then the Russians will intend or move forward to try to probe those intentions, check those intentions, especially as what the Republican presidential presumptive nominee is on the campaign trail saying the Russians can do whatever the hell they want. That is the type of rhetoric that could you lead to probes that again lead to war. And when we're talking about Moldova, we're not talking about, oh, well, you know, the, this dreamed like communist invasion of Australia and the New Zealand because domino effect. The Russians invaded Moldova in the 90s. The transitions are openly waving their arm, angling for that. The Russians openly talk about like Ukraine not necessarily being the end. Until then, you know, they get in front of the Western audience and they say, oh, no, totally. This will be the last one. I'm not saying that we need to fight the Russians off of every inch of land, because if we if if they have a single inch of land, therefore, they're going to then for sure invade Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. I'm not saying that. But let's account for these externalities. Let's account for these circumstances. Let's not go into this wide eyed, bushy tailed and naive and just assume that the Russians this time, even though they lied the other times, will be the last time after Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, Chechnya, and I mean, if you want to throw in there, Syria and Dagestan. Uh, you really think he's gonna go up against NATO, invade a NATO country and come against our arm in it? Our arm in it? Again, we, we've withheld- it, it depends, again, it depends on the actions of your presumptive nominee, especially if he becomes president. But if you keep signaling like, ah, do whatever the hell you want, maybe he starts to question what is Trump's motives? What is, what, what is he interested in? Is he interested in defending Europe? Is this something that really concerns him? How much does he care about Estonia? 
I mean, Trump found a reason to abandon the Kurds. He said, oh, why are we pulling out of northeastern Syria? Oh, well, where were the Kurds with us on D-Day? You don't think he could make some cockamamie bullshit up about Estonia? Where were the Estonians during the Battle of the Bulge? Well, many of, I, I, you could probably, I mean, tons of different military formations, but that's not the point. They, he, if, if you were concerned, if, if, you, if he's saying, well, okay, fine, uh, I, I, you know, there could, you know, maybe he would keep going, but he doesn't want to fight NATO. I know I'll, I'll take that, you know, genuinely, like, of course, the Russians don't want to fight NATO on directly, but it's hard for me to take that suggestion seriously from somebody who's supporting the presumptive nominee that is degrading NATO's capability that would, you know, dissuade and deter a Russian invasion. The good stuff, you know, the powerful stuff, the air support, all that type of thing. Um, I don't think Putin is, is that stupid, quite honestly. But my, my main question is, we, we've done a terrible job of looking back in history retrospectively and just asking the question, what, what has been the result of our foreign entanglements? How did we get from Glasnost and Perestroika and the fall of the Soviet Union and a real concern and, and me in the minds between Gorishov and, and uh, you know, Baker and Bush in terms of, you know, how, what can we do to cooperate with you guys? How did we get there? Well, Transnistria was ignored. Georgia was kind of, you know, there was a little bit of reaction, not much. The first invasion of Ukraine into Crimea. I mean, there, there's, if the problem, if what he's going to suggest is we just weren't nice enough to the Russians after we looked the other way in Chechnya twice, Dagestan, uh, we backed off of a lot on Syria, uh, Moldova, uh, Ukraine, twice. I mean, the first time uh, when they were uh, pushing Crimea, the second time when they invaded the Donbass illegally, and we had the intelligence showing it was clear. I mean, it was offset open intelligence they were doing that, and before eventually they've done a full invasion. What type of diplomatic overture could we should we have made to placate them that would have made them say, fine, okay, Ukraine can be its own diplomatic country. That wouldn't mean Ukrainian subservience to the Russians. I mean, he said that Ukraine can only exist as A, an extension of Russia, geopolitically and as a security apparatus, or B, as Russia, as in it doesn't exist. Guys, to, to you know, get rid of your nuclear stockpiles, to de denuclearize Ukraine. You know, how did we let that relationship completely degrade as opposed to, you know, integrating Russia into the West like we've allowed all of Russia's satellite nations to integrate. Why? Why what what, what happened here? Well, I, again, Putin. Uh, no, well, uh, come on. Listen, I, 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 think, I think the U.S. military industrial complex is not helpful. I don't think our intelligence agencies are helpful. And again, we're the good guys. I, I think American people are good. I think we've been misserved by people in power. And I think you have to think, really I, ask those questions. I think, I think it's important. You can be critical of people in power, yet still be pro-America. It's not like every time someone's critical to Ukraine, they're pro-Putin, or critical to any three-letter agency, they're anti-US. I think just putting people in those baskets is, is wrong. And, and talking about the uh, military-industrial complex, um, Congressman, <sighs> you, you have the worries, in your opinion, that Putin could proceed beyond Ukraine. Yet, considering we have Sweden and Finland just joined NATO, and you have Putin couldn't get to Kiev, he thought he'd be there within days or weeks. Do you really consider Putin crazy enough to invade more countries than just Ukraine? Yes! Yes, you moron! Yes! What do you fuck? We, people were saying that at the start of the invasion of Ukraine. You think Putin's crazy enough to invade Ukraine? Oh my god, you fucking, you want to be asleep. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I, I think we would do such a gross disservice if we underestimated how bad, uh, how evil, and how crazy he is. Yes. Um, look at the colossal mistake he's made with what he did two years ago. Ron's right. Mario, you're right. Uh, Putin probably thought he could take over Ukraine in two days. He messed up. I wish I wish Joe Walsh was more confrontational here, but he's just being very, very polite. Uh, he's concerned about NATO. Well, thank you, Vladimir Putin. Thank you for what you did to NATO. NATO's never been this unified. NATO is expanding. NATO is stronger. Uh, member countries in NATO are are paying more 
uh, for the de their defense and for assistance to Ukraine. Um, Ron and I probably agree on a lot of issues because I'm not a neocon and when I was in Congress I, I agreed that we spend way too much on defense and I don't want America to be the world's policeman and I don't want to do all the nation building. Ron and I agree with a lot of that stuff. Um, what's so interesting about this is trying so hard to appeal. Putin didn't invade a NATO country. If he had, there'd be American boots on the ground right now. Uh, no questions asked. And, and they, Putin invaded a NATO adjacent country. Again, it depends on how much you degrade American credibility on NATO deterrence, but yes, hypothetically. A country that would like to be into NATO, a country that would like to be into the EU. Um, so, so what would he do beyond that? And by the way, the expansion of NATO that's the other contextual element here. Putin wants to grow his empire again. Uh, NATO is expanding. That's a good thing. NATO upholds peace. It's a security alliance, right, for all countries who want to be free, respect the rule of law. It's a good thing that Eastern European countries want to be in NATO. But, Ron, I've never, I, I don't know your opinion on this, and Mario, I don't know yours. When Russia invaded, what should we have done right away? Or should we have done anything? Well, first of all, I mean, I supported and voted for the first $40 billion tranche for two reasons primarily. I was hoping that if Putin would see a unified West, again, having failed to take him over, he just, okay, let's, let's. By the way, if he, a unified West, continuing to support Ukraine and continuing to send support to Ukraine, again, much better negotiating position. And this thing, and by the way, that's what, it might, what, it, what might have been happening in Istanbul until Boris Johnson screwed it up, probably at the behest of the Biden administration. Again, I, I don't know what happened there. Um, so you know, that, that's, that's one factor to consider. The, the other thing I would point out is, you know, you, you take a look again at the, the arc of history here. Uh, you know, I was all for freedom-loving people of the Maidan, you know, wanting to exercise their freedom and, and turn toward the West and integrate economically. But in hindsight, again, I meet with European delegations to this day, and I'm not going to rat them out in terms of you know, the ones that say this, but I, I ask them a lot of questions. And I ask them, to what extent was the U.S. involved in fomenting that? Oh so I get my pretty honest God. answers. Well, it always takes people on the ground, oh boy. but those people need help. So you have the Rose Re Revolution in Georgia. That is threatening to to Russia, so then they invade. And so they now they occupy parts of Georgia. You have the, the revolution of dignity in Ukraine, 2014. You have the You know, those American revolutionaries, like people talk about parent and patriotism, like no representation without no taxation without representation. Dumb, stupid, cringe, French psyop, whole way. Those Frenchies did it, man. That freedom shit is stupid. It's a French psyop. The My French side up the whole time. Like, yeah, we provided money to local organizations and like, like, but none of it was, oh boy, we're gonna get you out there and overthrow the government. It was all like funding. I mean, we can go through the f funding ourselves, but it had to do with border regulation. It had to do with fighting against trafficking and uh, both uh, human trafficking, sex trafficking. Uh, some of it had to do with like democracy initiatives and funds towards organizations that like trains judges, that trains election monitors and stuff like that. Like some of those organizations are obviously gonna be full of people who are pro-democracy, right? If you're an election monitor, you're probably against the more authoritarian style of government. A lot of the people we probably work with probably are more favorable towards the West, more favorable towards more democratic institutions. But ultimately, it was the brutalization of protesters by Poroshenko's government and showing the ugly face of authoritarianism that turned the people against them and got them out on the streets and overthrew the government. That's what happened on top of the anti-corruption sentiment that got people out of the street to not only participate in the Euromaidan, but the Automaidan. So as much as American involvement was in the country, existed in the like you know, funding of election monitors, we have yet to find any evidence that we were like funding agents to overthrow this, to overthrow that. We have, it's been 10 years, still haven't found anything. Uh, they force out uh, Yanukovych. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I think Putin was happy with Ukraine, with Yanukovych, you know, somebody who is, they call him a puppet. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say. He, he apparently democratically elected. Um, you always have to question those elections. But again, it, it was when he got toppled that things started turning south. And then, you know, Putin realized, well, I've got my, my Black Sea fleet. By the way, does none of the morals of this matter? Like, like, like if I ask Ron Johnson, if we went, if somebody murdered a hundred protesters in his state, let's say they were protesting for the Second Amendment or something. Let's say that the government was going back on its promise and they said, you know what, we are gonna ban all these guns actually. And so people came out and protested. And so the government hired MS-13 gangsters to go kill them. And then they went and they beat them up, killed them, killed over a hundred people. Like at that point, if you're the protesters, what do you do? Do you roll over because of the fear of Russian intervention? Do you reside yourself to being dominated by a foreign power? What if we found out that that gun ban was influenced by the Chinese government? Let's say the Chinese government made your state ban guns and we found that out after there was a promise in your state not to do so. And then in reaction to the protests and react after that was announced in the middle of the night, they sent out gangsters and thugs to kill a hundred of your own residents. Once you draw out that scenario, how much Western intervention is really necessary to piss off people to hate you enough to overthrow your government? Like, I mean, it's not, I will never say it's impossible that we didn't do anything because I don't know. I don't have information or access to that. But honestly, even if we did, it's hard for me to imagine it going any differently if we completely stripped any and all involvement we could have had, including election monitoring. It's hard to say because it's just such a disgusting thing to do to your own population. It's such it's the ugly face of authoritarianism. Of course, that was the result. And would you have not stood up in your country if it was happening in here, in our home? It makes me question exactly what our legislators would do at a time of crisis. Say if there was somebody who threatened our democratic institutions. But this Republican senator going into the 2024 election probably has none of those concerns on his mind. Why would he? In Crimea, I better protect that. Uh, we've got these Russian-speaking people more aligned with us, you know, invade eastern Ukraine. Again, all I'm saying is what precipitated this? Again, just because people speak Russian does not mean they support Russia. We speak English. We're not Brits. The Irish speak English. They're not Brits. And as, as much as, you know, just in your heart you support people that are, are yearning for freedom and, and rebel that way, that revolution of dignity when all said and done, hasn't turned out well for Ukraine. That, again, that's what I'm saying. You have to, you have to look. Okay. Well, in the same way that I imagine that after the farmers' revolt, well, when was the farmers' revolt? Farmers' revolt, American Revolution. I bet during Shays' Rebellion in 1787, the Brits were giggling at, oh, those stupid colonists, <laughs> fighting, fighting farmers. See, if they had a strong king and all of this stupid local government freedom stuff, everything would be there, everything would be good. This revolution thing was a mistake. Or maybe you would go a little bit further to the War of 1812. And you'd go and you'd be like, oh my gosh, look at the White House. Guys, the White House has been burnt down. I, oof, this revolution stuff was a huge mistake. Yes, when you revolt for something like freedom against an overlurching power that wants to dominate you, that overlurching power will probably attempt to dominate you, as the British tried to do to us, and as the Russians tried to do to the Ukrainians. Obviously, they're not one-to-one -one situations, but I think you guys get the point. But there have also been strides in Ukrainian society against, against corruption with pro-zero. They should do more, but there are advancements. They're going in the right way when it comes to corruption. The Ukrainians wanted to be part of the European market. If they can get their agricultural products pro competing in the uh, European market, that's going to be a huge boon to the breadbasket of Europe. If they can confront the government on its r abuses of, of their civil rights, of their civil liberties, Yes, that's going to be a good thing for them. These are all things that they wanted to strive for, that they think being part of the EU will help them strive towards, that they thought getting rid of Yanukovych would help them strive towards, since he was making himself subservient to another country after he promised to go into the EU association agreement, after the Russians did something they promised not to do after nuclear weapons were given up to them during the Budapest memorandum. 
I mean, what? Do I mean, come on. Are we really going to hold the Ukrainians to a different standard that we would hold ourselves when it comes to like how much we were willing to take? I just find it silly. Retrospectively, it what was the U.S. role in this? I mean, is there a better way of supporting freedom loving people as opposed to fomenting a revolution, toppling a regime that the idea that we see again now it's we toppled their regime. He said, you know, I talked to people about our possible involvement. And when you look at our involvement, again, it's like funding election monitors and different like civil society groups. And now it's we fomented and then overthrew the government. It, I, and this is, it, he knows the audience he's speaking to. He's not stupid. He knows what this reinforces in their heads. Is, you know, is going to be react to potentially very strongly by, by Putin. But Ryan, Congressman, you, is, oh, sorry, I'm just going to play a quick clip, uh, yeah. and I'd love your thoughts on this, yeah. uh, Congressman. So in 2014, and just for people in backstage, just prepare the clip um, of, of Newland, the, the infamous recording. In 2014, prior to the ouster of then-President uh, Yanukovych, and during the Maidan Revolution, then Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria... Look, why don't they have Ukrainians on, man? Can, they, can we ever get, like, Ukrainians on these types of shows? Because I'm sure if they got somebody in there that knew a little bit more about Ukrainian history, whatever. Newland, as you mentioned, Senator, was captured on a phone call plotting the composition of the new Ukrainian government. I'll be commenting on it. I don't like this uh, representation of it. Well, let's see what they play of the clip. I want the clip to be played briefly, and Senator, Congressman, I think you'll be able to watch it here. Mm -hmm. and I would because they're not going to include parts of the clip that I always think should be included. Let's get your thoughts on it. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here. So uh, I don't think Klitsch should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Klitsch and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week. Klitschko has been the top dog. I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three. I, I think we want to try to get somebody with an international personality to um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me uh, VFR saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Just to give the audience context about this recording, and, and I'm sure Congressman Senator, you know what I'm about to, to say, but a couple of months prior to this leaked call, uh, Klitschko was by far the front runner to become the president um, of Ukraine. And Yatsenyuk, if I'm, I'm pronouncing it correctly, was significantly lesser known. As you okay, to be clear, okay, you know, I'll let him finish his thing. Before I, before I interrupt, because I don't, I already don't like how it's being presented. I already don't think he's including context that should be included. I think Zero Hedge is a rag publication. Uh, so, I mean, this is expected to me. As you heard in the call, Newland said she preferred Yatsanyuk over Klitschko, and Klitschko should go into government. Weeks after the call, less than a month, I think, after the call, Klitschko drops out, and Yatsanyuk, if I'm again pronouncing it correctly, becomes prime minister. Um, I'm going to go to you right after, Senator, because you were in Ukraine not long after that. But, Congressman, based on what Senator just said about U.S. involvement prior to any war and prior to the ouster of, of Yanukovych, and that could have played a role in leading to the invasion we, right. we're dealing and with I, now. And I, and, I, and I will not say, as, as others have said, not about you, Ron, uh, that— Okay, so there's a few things I want to say. First thing I said is Yatsenyuk was the interim, interim leader. So what happened was, is after Yanukovych fled the country, they didn't have a leader. So parliament elected an interim leader, and Yatsenyuk was the interim leader before they had an election between Zelensky, uh, not Zelensky, uh, between uh, a bunch of different people that got Petro Poroshenko elected. And then Petro Poroshenko was the democratically elected leader of the country. Um, so in the long run, Yatsenyuk was interim president, and then it went over the Petro Poroshenko. We don't have any evidence that we were installed, that we installed them, that we chose this person to be interim president, just that Victoria Nuland thought that that person, Yatsenyuk, would be a better person for the role of president, and he ended up serving as interim president. Before then, democratic elections were held, and Petro Poroshenko was elected by the Ukrainian people. 
Uh, as for the idea that we chose these people, we just don't know. All we know is that that's who she would have preferred and that's who she was speculating about. I bet you that we could get, if we had unlimited access to every world leader's cell phones, running up to elections, you don't think that the French have conversations about who they think should be president of the United States? You don't think that the Germans do? You don't think that the Spanish do? I bet we can find phone calls. I'm saying, oh, well, oh, this person would be better for the job. This would be better for us. It'd be better for them. And if we got some all those phone calls together and we got a bunch of them saying, oh, Joe Biden, Joe Biden, Joe Biden, you could string all those together saying, wow, it seems like all these world leaders wanted Joe Biden to be the winner, huh? And Joe Biden's the winner. But this all... This is all just speculation. None of it is based in physical evidence because we don't have any physical evidence that she made them choose this or made them choose that. It's all speculative. And I don't know how much time I want to spend in the speculative. Uh, you don't believe Oh, also, what is not included is the fact that they wanted, uh, and this is really important, uh, Victoria Nuland wanted the Ukrainians to accept the deal that was being offered by the Yanukovych government. That's what they wanted. And then the protesters didn't do that. They went against that. So if this was controlled by them, then I feel like they would be, you know, listening to Victoria Newland and not disregarding what her concerns or what her wants were because she was fearful of, you know, Russian intervention. That we caused Putin to invade. Do we play any role? Um, I think, no, I think the expansion of NATO, again, the context here, the Soviet Union breaks up, Eastern Europe begins to go their own way. Eastern Europe wants to become a part of the- Man, I, I don't know if Joe Walsh is not, I don't know if Joe, Joe Walsh is the right person for this, honestly. West, part of freedom and liberty and the rule of law. That's certainly something that I think we should He's encourage. They want to be He's energetic, but I don't know how, I don't think he knows much of the history, at least not much of the recent history, if he doesn't understand the phone call. So I, but I don't know how much he spends time like engaging with these types of people. Become part of the EU and NATO. The EU and NATO, we are the good guy. I mean, nobody's a total good guy here, but we are the good guys. Putin is the bad guy. So the fact that a lot of these- It doesn't need to be boiled down to the, God, he could just challenge, he could just challenge the idea that we did this. Be like, the Ukrainian people had their revolution. We stand with it. It can be as simple as that. That we don't have any hard evidence that we made them do that. When you murder your own people, that can be quite an incentive to protest. These countries... Like, if we look at the civil rights movement, do you think that there was no, like, at all, like, Soviet agents within the civil rights movement? Like, none? Do you think there were no Soviet agents within, like all of uh, of a lot of the black struggle movements a lot of the black power movements there were there were now does that does so but if what i would then go and say is like oh civil rights is a communist plot that'd be stupid you know what caused the call for civil rights the bondage that's what caused the call for civil rights you want to know what caused the massive protests the murdering and beating of student protesters that's what caused it not american freedom pamphlets wanted to be part of where the good guys live. Again, it all comes down to our national interest. Is it still in our national interest? I think it is. But of course we should encourage that. And, and yeah, real politic, are there times we go beyond just encouragement? Sure, sure. But again, the overlay- here Again, I don't think he's, re I don't think he knows the situation very well. And so he's just avoiding it. Here, and then you can go to Senator Johnson. Putin was hell bent on doing this, period. This is step one, period. I don't know about a step two or three or four, but they consider Ukraine part of, they consider Ukraine Russia. His, his uh, criteria for not invading when NATO in the West did all they could with Putin publicly and privately once the troops were assembled on the border, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Putin demanded that Ukraine remain neutral, uh, and Putin demanded that NATO go back to pre-1997. I mean, go back decades and, and, and get rid of the NATO members of the countries who've joined. That's untenable, and that's not something we should agree, we should have agreed to. Senator, you were with Newland in a June 2014 delegation to the inauguration of then-President uh, Poroshenko. First question is, were you aware of Newland's activities, which many perceive, or to me it's relatively obvious, many perceive as meddling in Ukrainian politics? Yeah, no, that <laughs> I mean, meddling, again, like, 
We don't have any evidence she did anything outside of give her opinion for what, when you say meddle in Ukrainian politics, in the fact that she talked to protesters, asked their interests, acted as a mediator, or the idea that she chose this person, chose that person. If that's the case, then, I mean, like, the Soviets were interfering in Cuban, meddling in Cuban politics. I mean, like, yeah, we had a relationship, but he, no, but there was no evidence presented that we overthrew the government or we made or chose the makeup of the next government. She was talking about Yatsenyuk because he was a likely option. That is an uncomfortable level of meddling. Uh, he, he, you don't know. You just saw some audio and you took it at face value, Ron. I would just quick ask the question. What, what, what is You don't this? know meddling to what level. You don't know what that is. You just took it at face value from this rag. CI doing, CIA doing leaking all of its stations in Ukraine right now to the New York Times. That, that didn't just happen by accident. Uh, by the way, if you're... The CIA worked... The thing is, the report that people are talking about, and maybe we'll do a whole video on the on the New York Times report on the CIA involvement in Ukraine. Their relationship with the Ukrainian intelligence community, as established by the article, says it started after Euromaidan. The record starts after Euromaidan. Would it be that surprising that after the Russians invade and take over Crimea, and the revolution happens, and in a country that's military only had maybe 16,000 functioning, like, like well-trained, ready-to-fight soldiers, that it had to rely on militiamen and football clubs militarized on the back of pickup trucks to go fight rebels, that that country, after decades of Russian infiltration, might have an intelligence apparatus that they are fearful of could be heavily infiltrated by the Russians, which it was. And so because of that issue, on top of the fact that they now didn't, they certainly didn't have the Russians as an intelligence partner, they needed to upgrade their intelligence apparatus. They needed, because they were getting invaded and their land was getting conquered and their intelligence apparatus was deeply infiltrated, they needed the assistance of the United States to help them build their CIA so they could protect themselves, to have their own spies because they were heavily infiltrated. So yeah, that is true that that happened. And you can be favor of that, you can be against that. I'm not against it. You can have whatever belief you want about it. But at the end of the day, that was after the Euromaidan revolution. So you cannot use that as evidence for meddling that caused the Euromaidan revolution if the record in the report starts after the Euromaidan revolution. Vladimir Putin, how would you view, and by the way, he knew that before we knew it. I'm sure he's fully aware of what CIA uh, stations are, are operating with the Ukraine. When I first went to Ukraine in 2011, Yanukovych was in power, just beating Timoshenko. And the whole U.S. effort there was, how do we help Ukraine rid itself of the legacy of corruption? Corruption in the wheat markets, uh, the oligarchs controlling the media. You know, we by the way, this investment that he's talking about, that he says he supports, is the very corruption that the Russians and John Mearsheimer believes is the diabolical Western influence that they want to fight against. So if you're in favor of that, but then, like, I... <sighs> incomprehensible. We have always talked about that. I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, America has oligarchs in media, too. We just call them billionaires. Wait, is he not against that? Okay, we do... You know what? I'm just going to let the senator talk, and we're probably going to wrap this up in the next few minutes because we're only like an hour something in, not even like that because we've only been watching this really for 30-something minutes. But damn, man, I, I just can't do the full thing. I'm sorry. I just don't want to. Um, but it, that was a whole effort. Then you have the Maidan. You know, after the Maidan, it was all about, okay, now, now how do we uh, help the Democratic elected? Again, I, I didn't realize we had this level of meddling. You know, from, from, um... Dude, did he j oh, wait, okay, back up, back up, back up. Is he just finding this out for the first time and just took from zero hedge that on face value? Brilliant, Ron Johnson. You truly are a political mastermind. Thank you for just taking this host at face value. Don't trust the media. The media are liars and they're, and they're thieves and they, they hate the conservative movement. Trust Zero Hedge at face value about a conflict where this guy has never, you know, has this guy even, who's presenting even been to Ukraine? How much does he know about Ukraine? Is this something that like was prepared for him or is this like his, his cockamani, cockamani like production? I don't know. You know, U.S. Senator is just, you know, okay, how, how do we help them uh, break free of the Soviet Union and, and break free of the legacy of, of corruption? Um, th that would have been the whole effort. I had no idea of the CIA stations there. And, and again, you have to understand, how does Putin view that? How would we view that? You know, we weren't, didn't take real kindly when... Uh, uh, 
in, in the uh, Khrushchev, when Khrushchev put nuclear missiles in, in Cuba. I mean, we almost went to war over that. Okay. Yeah, but we didn't put missiles in Ukraine. They invaded Ukraine with no missiles in them. In fact, we took the missiles out of Ukraine and gave them to Russia. I couldn't, this is the thing I don't like the Cuba, Ukraine comparison, because in this comparison, it would be, you know, they took the missiles out of Cuba. We took the missiles out of Ukraine. That's where it should have ended. They, in this scenario, they take the missiles out of Cuba. They were like, great, the missiles are gone. Let's invade. Cuba's always been part of America. It's all, you know, 51st state. That would be the comparison. Again, I'm not saying we were putting nuclear missiles in there, but we're setting up spy sites. Again, that's that's not the actions. Again, that was done post Post, as far as we know, according to the New York Times report, Euromaidan revolution. How are you going to expect the Ukrainians not to allow U American intelligence operations to help them defend themselves after the Russians invade Ukraine and take Crimea? How are you going to expect that? Of course, they're going to look to defend themselves. Of course, they're going to look to reform their intelligence apparatus. Of course, they're going to look for Western help when they're getting invaded. We would. We have. Of a friendly nation that is trying to allow Russia to integrate with the West. It becomes more and more hostile. And that's the whole point I was, I was making. What happened from 1990, the spirit of glasnost and perestroika, to the point now we're, we're back into a proxy war, mm. another Cold War with Russia, and, and we're talking... Like, people can use this as a proxy war if they want, but proxy war, I do feel like, in a lot of people's minds, makes the assumption that the people, Ukraine... Like, there's no, the Russians don't have a proxy. The Russians are directly fighting the Ukrainians, right? So that's number one. Number two, the Ukrainians would fight if they were on their own too. Like they, they want to fight. This isn't an instance of us propping up some unpopular dictatorship and because we're scared of the geopolitical jostling that's going on in the reason and we want another chess piece. Talking about what a 50-50 chance of, I don't necessarily agree with that, yeah. Yeah. of a nuclear conflict, I mean. So he doesn't even agree with it. Okay, that's something to take note of, by the way. Something's gone terribly wrong here that we ought to analyze, you know, what role do we play in this as well? And that's, and Ron, that's healthy. But you make it sound like you're putting so much of the onus on us. When the context here again is Putin. Again, I said up front, Putin's an evil war criminal, had no justification to invade. What? But, but Wait, no, I'm sorry. You just like laid out a bunch of like, well, it looks like the West was meddling. Oh, and it looks like our meddling was too much. And well, it looks like all this expansion. Like you're laying down what would be the justifications while also saying there's no justifications. From per his perfect perspective, you know, we, we're poking, poking him in the eye all the time. You don't consider, you don't consider this poking in the no, eye? I don't consider that poking in the eye. I consider that countries like Ukraine and these other... It's, it's called Ukraine defending itself. Like Russia invades Crimea, then Ukraine's like, okay, we're going to allow American spies in to help us try to protect ourselves. Oh my God, what a provocation. Get off your... Get off... I own his own fucking supply, man. Come on. Baltic state countries, free of the Soviet Union, right? Now wanting to be part of the West, wanting to be more free. Again, our role should be as much as possible. We encourage that. We'll, we'll maybe quibble over how far. Man, they're really, this gold, uh, these people selling gold, birch gold, they got heavy ad placement this episode, huh? <laughs> they, they, really, they really bought up this debate. We should encourage that. Real politic is a part of that, and we always got to be vigilant against that stuff. But yes, when you're dealing with countries that want to be free, and then you've got this guy Putin who's trying to grab them and pull them back, I think it's in our national interest to try to stop that. Okay, Kitty, this is where he would be like, the majority of uh, the number one America export market is Europe. We are deeply ingrained with Europe. European stability does help American stability. This is where Joe Walsh should build the case for why it's in America's interest on top of it being the morally correct, like it's also a correct cause. It's like a good cause, a correct cause, a good cause, a morally good cause. Righteous Congressman, cause. Just, just before we go to you, Senator, Congressman, if, if we found out that Ukraine shares a, shares a probably the, the European country that shares the biggest border with Russia, if we had the same thing happen in Canada, for example, where Russia was meddling in Canadian politics and playing a role in wh who, who becomes prime minister. Again, this assumes that they chose who the prime minister was, but also this assumes that we 
Dude, there's so much. I already did the Cuba analysis. I don't need to do another comparison. I think I already made the comparison. Do you? Th how do you think the U.S. should respond, and do you consider that prodding? If Canada was part of America, part of the United States, and Canada broke free, like if we had a big American Union here, our whole hemisphere, and Canada broke free, and Mexico broke free, and they wanted to be free and sovereign nations, um, and, and the United States said, no, screw that. We're going to invade. We're going to try to take Canada back, take Mexico back. And Canada and Mexico turn toward Putin if he was the good guy in this scenario and says, help us. I would think Putin and other countries would help. Countries trying to be free. Senator, Sovereign countries. Senator, how much of an impact? And, and you've kind of hinted at that. Again, like Joe Walsh isn't like, I think I'm going to end it here. Because Joe Walsh isn't challenging him on the foundations of like the, the arguments about like, oh, we meddled, we, we, we controlled who the person was. There's so much speculation that's kind of, he's saying some people say it's obvious because he, he knows there isn't any hard evidence for it. And Joe Walsh just giving it to him. And Joe Walsh, I think, is doing the best he can. I think he's, I mean, he was a nice guy from when I met him, right? Um, but I don't think that, you know, the stuff that Zero Hedge has prepared or the questions or the history he's bringing up that he's prepared to deal with it. I think I'm going to end this here. Um, Ron Johnson didn't, I think, say anything particularly convincing. It's a lot of the same old, same old. Um, the Boris Johnson stuff, Boris Johnson destroyed peace, etc. cetera. Uh, very disappointing that there, I don't know how much depth uh, the isolationists have here, but it's going to get boring if this is just going to be every debate about this moving forward. Because, and I'm not trying to say that to be like, oh, you know, this debate, this war, uh, talking about the war is getting boring. I mean, that is like, it's just the same stuff again and again and again. We need some variety, man. How about instead of bringing up Victoria Nuland, they can find a new uh, uh, upper mid-level American bureaucrat to get a hate boner for. Why not?